Great, thank you. Let's start again. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for this opportunity. And, and as, as as Richard has mentioned, I'm I'm going to talk today about some things coming out of the book that has already been published, but um, uh, given various circumstances, of which you'll all be aware, um, I haven't had much of an opportunity to to present um, to people or to discuss with people. Um, and um, and one of those opportunities was meant to be at sort of PSGB. Um, Conference Oxford, where I was going to be talking alongside others about the role of, of film in educational research. And so today I, I sort of wanted to touch on some of those things whilst also drawing out some of the main um, points from the book, or at least the impetus and rationale behind it and, and where that's kind of led me to. So um, the title of my presentation today is What Does Education Look Like, which is supposed to be quite an ambitious um, title, but um, really in lots of ways um, all that is meant to suggest is possibly something of a shift in um, the way that we talk about education um, from what we might call the kinds of either intellectual or ontological um, ways of talking about it as a concept and more towards um, the perceptual um, and perhaps the visual, what we can actually see um, of education out in the world um, as opposed to what we know it to be. Um, so in this presentation I want to describe this, this shift um, in my own approach to research at least um, from thinking about education as something that we conceptualize intellectually um, or theoretically, but from something that we conceptualize uh, intellectually or theoretically and um, towards something that focuses on, on how we come into an understanding of the concept via these more perceptual means, um, both in terms of the impressions left on us by initial encounters with educational phenomena, so the basic building blocks of um, what we commonly understand as uh, things relating to education, schools, teachers, curricula, um, children, um, teaching, learning, classrooms, all of these sorts of things. So the impressions left on us by those phenomena and how those impressions then translate into the expressions uh, we use to talk about them, um, particularly in the use of this one word, education. Um, finally, I want to stress the sort of primacy of film in this approach, um, because I consider it not so much to be a sort of illustrative tool in talking about things to do with education, but rather I want to look at and talk about film um, as uh, research where we kind of lead from the visual um, rather than use the visual to support our ideas about education. So leading from what we see of it out in the world. Um, so I see it more as a medium for representing um, education and educational phenomena in such a way that we can respond to it almost as we would to reality itself, a contentious term, but I'm sure um, reality. But film on this view can almost be seen as the best source, I think, for empirical observations concerning the meaning or meanings that education can assume, both in our language, visual and verbal, um, and therefore also in our culture. So the sort of subtitle of the book is, is um, a conceptual aesthetics, which is possibly a bit of um, uh, a fancy term in some ways, but by that what I really wanted to um, put across was that the book is looking at this concept of education in terms of the shapes and forms it assumes um, in, in various forms of language um, and how then uh, we come to judge or criticize those shapes and, and forms in response. 
Um, so that is my own understanding of, of aesthetics um, and uh, the aesthetics, therefore, of concepts. As I've explained, therefore, there are, there are kind of two separate things going on, both in the book and, and I guess in my research um, more generally, which is one to try and shift maybe the language of um, talking about education towards this more um, kind of visual um, aesthetic um, discourse uh, and away from a preoccupation with what education either is or what or theorizing its aims and purposes um, but also to concentrate on the world of the visual um, and the way in which a visual medium like uh, film draws our attention back to first encounters with educational phenomena and how those phenomena come to cohere as a concept we then call education. Um, so conceptual aesthetics, I suppose, is sort of somewhat summed up as the creative and critical interplay between impression and expression when conceptualizing education. So the, the book opens with this kind of curious question, can we see education? And um, I take it that um, this question should sound a bit off to people um, because we don't often talk about being able to see it. Um, we don't even talk in terms of being able to see it or, um, for example, to point at it. What does it mean to try and point at education? The trouble when thinking in these terms um, or asking this kind of question is that it seems to prompt the need to point at something, um, whether that be a, a classroom uh, filled with people, um, children learning scientific experiments, etc., whether that be a particular educational text or a philosophy of education that informs our understanding, or whether that be pointing at um, a definition of education in the dictionary. I think one of the reasons why this question prompts in us um, a sense of hesitation um, has a lot to do with the fact that uh, we feel like maybe uh, pointing at any one thing can only do an injustice to all of the other things that, that are possibly involved. Not just that, but many people might possibly rightly um, protest that actually education isn't something that can be pointed at, that in fact it's something a lot more invisible. Um, it's things going on inside us uh, that we can't actually see, whether those are things taking place in the mind, in um, the heart or in the soul even and therefore um, trying to point at education will always be insufficient um, to um, what it actually is. In some ways it somewhat troubles me this idea that we can't see education because I then sort of think to myself well if we can't see it how do we ever know that it's going on? Um, and certainly there are plenty of um, theories and philosophies of education um, in circulation um, that resist the notion that it can be reducible to the visual world. Um, but then um, that ought to prompt in us at the same time a feeling of kind of doubt perhaps that we can never know or ever know whether someone else is educated or not um, because we cannot literally see inside them whether they share the same experience um, of education let alone knowledge or understanding of it. One of the, there are a couple of reasons at least I think that, um, that we experience obstacles to thinking of education in terms of something that we might be able to see. Um, and the first of those, I think, is sort of quite neatly captured in um, a phrase of, of R.S. Peters, where he says, uh, education is what it is and not some other thing. 
And um, immediately what we get from um, this statement, I think, is the idea that A, education is or must be something, um, and B, it is that thing to the exclusion of other things. Um, as I go on to show, um, I, I somewhat disagree. Uh, I think that education, when taken in visual terms, can be seen to be all sorts of things. Um, and in fact, we can tolerate all sorts of meanings of it, um, in our, both in our visual and kind of verbal um, grammar. So, um, however, uh, Peter sort of somewhat expresses, I think, a tendency to want to uh, tie down this meaning such that um, it, it doesn't become too relativized. Another obstacle, I think, is sort of um, articulated in um, a, uh, an article um, by Beaster, Allen and Edwards about research uh, capacity building in, in educational research from 2011, um, where they are placing the emphasis on um, theory as um, uh, the primacy of theory in, in trying to conceptualize education, which is to say that theory must come first um, if we are to understand um, the phenomena um, which uh, we then um, conceptualize in, in relation to, to educational thought. Um, so the key challenge, they say, um, is to focus the attention on object theory, that is the theories we use to conceptualize the phenomena in which we are interested and the theories we use to make sense of empirical findings. The emphasis placed on, on theory here um, is one placed on kind of theoretical lenses, and, and that is largely, I think, its preoccupation. Um, whereas I wonder what happens when we do things completely the other way around, where we start with the phenomena and think about how those phenomena um, start to cohere as concepts in, in our language, um, and then think about the sorts of theories that currently um, uh, we apply to those and whether they are adequate uh, to um, earlier encounters with those, those same phenomena and how we currently conceptualize or talk about education. Um, so both talking in terms of what education is or seeking to find theories or definitions for it uh, can prove significant obstacles to actually seeing um, it uh, in its actuality. So I take some inspiration from, um, so from uh, the writing and, and thought of Ludwig Wittgenstein in um, sort of trying to overcome uh, these kinds of uh, obstacles, um, particularly as a sort of research method um, or approach, because he also observes that in philosophy, we are often um, forced to look at a concept in a certain way. Education is what it is and not some other thing. Whereas he's more inclined to try and suggest or even invent other ways of looking at it. Furthermore, he then seeks to show uh, that it was absurd to expect the concept to conform to those narrow possibilities. Thus, your mental cramp is relieved and you are free to look around the field of use of the expression and to describe the different kinds of uses of it. Um, so uh, I'm interested in, in what he's sort of saying here about relieving our, our mental cramp and inviting us to see education possibly in its multivariousness rather than trying to tie it down um, either to a particular meaning or as the subject of uh, particular theories. But how does this mental cramp arise? Well, um, one way that, again, Wittgenstein um, sort of articulates this is to use the example of um, St. Augustine, who asks a similar question to the one that I frequently ask myself about 
um, education when trying to work out whether we know what sort of a thing it is. Um, Augustine poses to himself the, the question in the Confessions, what uh, then is time? And um, he says to himself that uh, if nobody asks me what time is, then I, I know what it is. But if anyone asks me, um, I no longer know. And there is this conundrum in um, feeling perfectly happy with um, a concept as you go about your um, daily lives or ordinary intercourse, as um, Wittgenstein sometimes puts it. But as soon as someone asks you to articulate it as an abstract idea, um, it becomes altogether more problematic. The confusion that arises here, um, again, Wittgenstein says, is that the concept becomes something that we know when no one asks us, but no longer know when we are supposed to give an account of it. And it is something that we need to remind ourselves of. Um, this concept that seemed so familiar, so close to hand almost, such as time, suddenly becomes problematic when someone asks, what is time? Equally, we might feel that we have um, this problem when it comes to, to education, and uh, hence why um, we might revert back to an instinct to tie it to particular definitions and theories, rather than recognise that it doesn't cause us all too many problems um, in ordinary encounters. But I'd like the phrasing here um, that we need to remind ourselves because actually um, what, what Wittgenstein is sort of saying is we will need um, to, to look again at the sorts of things that inform that understanding rather than um, simply seeking uh, an abstract definition um, from uh, say textual scholarship. Let me know if I'm sort of moving too fast. Um, so the tendency towards either theory or definition is, is strong, and I, I think this is probably still the case in um, uh, a, a lot of research in, in education, um, that of course it helps um, to situate ourselves in relation to a particular idea if we are going to um, articulate the sorts of things um, that we would like to see happen uh, as a consequence of, of education. In short, we feel like perhaps a strong idea of the concept has to inform any educational practice and activity that ensues from it. Um, uh, and yet, it's clearly not the case that on a day-to-day -day basis we all adhere to one of these strict dictionary definitions. Um, the sorts of things that um, come to mind, phrases like, um, uh, you know, I can't say that I had a very good education, or it's important that you make the most of your education, um, don't require um, particular definitions in order to make sense. However, we do still have this tendency, I think, to gravitate towards fixed definitions, um, I see this a lot in, you know, even immediately uh, undergraduate essays, the amount of them that like to begin with the Oxford English Dictionary gives the definition of education as. Um, and this concerns me because I sort of think that perhaps um, the argument has been closed down before it's had a chance to really um, open itself up to all the possibilities. Wittgenstein describes this tendency as common to all sorts of other questions as well. So what is language? What is a proposition? And we feel like um, we have to give an answer to these questions once and for all and independently of any future experience. The idea that we don't want what we say now to be contradicted um, by encounters or experiences in the future. This idea that we might be able to, to tie education down to um, particular definitions um, can be witnessed um, in expressions even 
like those of Dewey and Arendt, such as education as a fostering, a nurturing, a cultivating process, which in some ways um, people might argue, well, immediately you can sort of visualize that. But at the same time, are we only visualizing um, what we want to see in it? Um, because arguably, um, I suppose all sorts of things could be fostered, nurtured and cultivated uh, in, in education and not all of them desirable and not all of them particularly Jewian. Equally, education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it. Makes me question whether we can actually see um, when this has actually happened, but also whether um, this is true of all kinds of education. Um, things that we accept as education, um, even though they don't conform to Hannah Arendt's um, definition. Because after all, can't, can't we also say things like the following? As they say, um, something like, I can't say I had a particularly good education, doesn't necessarily conform with um, Hannah Arendt's notion that um, it, it is the point at which we assume um, responsibility for the world. There are many other examples, and I've just taken a selection from um, Victorian novels here, um, or Georgian Victorian, I suppose, um, where we're presented with lots of different um, uh, variations on, on the word and different usages of it. There is, I believe, in every disposition a tendency to some particular evil, a natural defect which not even the best education can overcome. It's from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. I let you go as a babe because you were pretty and I feared your loveliness. A form so straight and fine, I argued, must conceal a mind warped and cruel. I had little faith in the power of education to rectify such a mind. If I were equipped with um, only Dewey's and Arendt's um, formulations of education, I might not be able to understand very well what Miss Darcy or Mrs. Pryor are talking about here. But in paying closer attention to the context of their discussion, I know very well that in fact they are expressing um, both an understanding that prevailed at the time that they are writing, but also something of their own personality and psychology within these expressions. Um, both of which communicate something about education being a limit, a limit to which um, formal instruction or moulding of character um, can actually, for example, create a good person. There is either something innate in that person or something beyond formal instruction um, that can aid or prevent um, a person becoming um, good or um, or not. Equally, um, the definition that comes from Mr Bounderby in Charles Dickens' Hard Times, I'll tell you what education is, to be tumbled out of doors, neck and crop, and put upon the shortest allowance of everything except blows, that's what I call education. Now again, of course this doesn't conform um, with some of um, uh, the, with, with the Dewey and Arendtian formulations, but it's something that I immediately recognise, even if I don't agree with it. Um, it is a mode of discipline um, that uh, uh, it, it is fundamentally kind of recognisable and to which we can then respond, um, well, uh, that's not going to serve a very good purpose or, or whatever it is. Um, but it has to be recognisable in order um, for us to have that response. The trouble with education's isness, apologies for that, but um, I couldn't think of a, a, a better way to put it almost, the idea that education is this or is that, uh, that it has this aim or that purpose, is that its tendency towards uh, fixity can become a distraction from what we actually say and see. Definitions can be helpful, and I don't want to completely deny this, um, 
but uh, as Baker and Hacker say, they teach us the use of expressions oftentimes. They avert misunderstandings and confirm shared understandings. But um, they cannot be seen to apply always and everywhere. And um, I think we can get carried away with that sometimes if we are not, if our attention isn't always also drawn towards the visual world in which these things um, can both find validation but also be challenged. Wittgenstein's concern throughout the philosophical investigations is that we shouldn't take language to stop at the need for clarity of definition, but that we should be a wary of letting mere observations turn themselves into scientific definitions and b pay due attention to our capacity to use the same words in different contexts under different conditions. In so doing, we are alerted to the fact um, that our, our language is elastic and, and malleable um, and uh, that uh, we can see um, or apply words and concepts in, in more than one situation whilst also finding limits to their application and I think this is important because that runs through his work also. Um, there is a reason why um, we can say something like I don't, I don't uh, I think I had a very good education, for example, um, but if a child re returns home from school and says I had a good education today, um, there was something about that expression that might fall flat, either because we don't believe that that child has sufficient experience or conceptual understanding to use the word in that way, or simply because we don't think um, that anyone should express um, themselves uh, by saying I think I had a good education today that it grammatically simply doesn't work. All of this is somewhat to kind of emphasize once again that in fact there is a very strong, strong connection between word and world, uh, the way that we learn these things, uh, and that this can be forgotten about uh, in the pursuit of um, an idea or concept of education that seems to answer all of our needs. Um, so uh, particularly because we think that education is not something that can be seen, um, all the more reason to try and tie it to particular definitions. However, there is a danger in turning simply to the text for answers and explanations because this can create um, what I've called uh, a dictionary mindset, always looking to the text or, or the dictionary, Google or Wikipedia for the answer to something rather than looking up from the page um, to see whether the world actually attests to um, or challenges some of the things that um, even the dictionary talks about. Um, there's a great example in, uh, of, of this in motion um, in Stanley Cavell's um, essay, Must we, Must we Mean What We Say, where he talks about um, a situation in which you are sitting in an armchair and uh, you're reading uh, what he calls a book of remembrances and you come across this word, an umiak, another word that is completely unfamiliar. And so what do you do? Well, of course, you reach for your dictionary and you look it up. But what do we do in reaching for a dictionary and trying to fill the gap in our knowledge um, created by um, this word? Did we actually find out what an umiak means or what an umiak is? How could we have discovered something about the world by hunting in the dictionary? And um, essentially what he's saying is, um, that our encounter with this unusual um, thing, uh, the way we go about filling the gap in our knowledge is um, 
one which really ends up affirming more the relationship we have with dictionaries than it does about our experience with things in the world. Um, it doesn't say, it says very little about what we end up knowing of the Umiak, um, which is um, a sort of canoe um, that is used by the Inuit and Yupik people, um, who themselves don't rely on di dictionary definitions um, in order to give uh, the thing meaning in their own lives. To remind ourselves of the conditions in which we actually apprehend a thing, we have to look up from the page um, and go along with, um, I suppose, uh, the Wittgensteinian imperative, don't think, but look. If we accept that we learn language and learn the world together, where then does this leave us with the word education? Unlike a canoe, it is, as discussed, not easily pointed out. But how does this fusion of word and world occur in this instance, such that we are able to give a meaning to education? There are a number of things to take away from the Umiak example in exploring our concept of education. Firstly, that once again, language assumes meaning within a context both within language games and the broader forms of life in which their expression, according to Wittgenstein, has become necessary. He says, it is only in a language that I can mean something by something. Secondly, if we are truly to explore that meaning and not simply affirm modes of knowing already in existence, then we must begin by assuming a position of relative ignorance in relation to that which we hope to explore and to look up from our books that would define education for us and back at the world around us. And thirdly, the Umiak is a reminder that we cannot traverse borders between forms of life through the abstraction of knowledge. Definitions and theories might like to transcend the contingent circumstances of um, utterance and observation, um, but in fact, um, that's that does not afford them this kind of bird's eye view of everything. We always see things um, from our place. So the kind of knowledge abstraction that occurs in dictionary de definition is itself part of a form of life that often makes it in fact harder for us to see what is happening elsewhere. So how can we look up from the page? Um, well, one way to draw our attention back to the perceptual character of conceptual understanding is to think of all expressions relating to education as communicate simply a picture of it as a concept. Um, and uh, the word picture th occurs throughout um, the philosophical investigations. Um, and according to David Egan, although um, the word picture has uh, multiple different meanings and some of them are simple as referring to a portrait or a drawing, um, but others are mostly, as David Egan describes them, ways of conceiving a matter. So any kind of expression, proposition or utterance or statement on the subject or relating to education could be taken as a picture. By describing these conceptions as pictures, we are provided with the means to go beyond thinking of them as simply right or wrong. We don't have to look for the right definition or the right theory, um, but simply these are all different ways of representing the same matter. Some of them may be more suitable than others or more informative um, or even more interesting. So thus we are able to make sense of them and their usefulness in relation to our present reality. That's not to say, however, that certain pictures don't prevail upon us more than others. Um, and they sort of endure in our um, imagination uh, much longer than others as ways of perhaps um, expressing exactly how things are. These might be pictures such as um, Rousseau's Emile, but almost maybe um, more predominant uh, 
uh, I should think is, is um, the allegory of the cave in, uh, in Plato's Republic. Um, these are the sorts of pictures that continue to inform our, our, our understanding of um, educational narratives almost um, and, and structure that in, in very powerful ways. Um, but when thought about simply as pictures, they can um, uh, be challenged by all sorts of other ones. Um, because after all, um, again, um, Wittgenstein reminds us that pictures can hold us captive. Um, we can be so fascinated by them um, that we don't see things otherwise. We cannot get outside of them because they lie in our language and language repeats them to us inexorably. It's interesting to think that there might be other pictures such as this that um, could also perform the same function. They simply don't have the same representation within our language. For instance, a tale um, such as Ibn Tufail's 12th century narrative of Hai Ibn Yaqzan um, is one which uh, charts the story of a young boy who grows up alone on an island um, and is essentially meant to capture the essence of autodidacticism, man's capacity to teach himself something um, with no one else um, but God to guide him. Um, were this another culture, this, this picture might have um, equal representation um, or greater representation than perhaps Rousseau or Plato. Um, and so it's always worth thinking about the pictures um, that could inform um, our understanding of concepts differently. All of this is sort of leading up to, um, it's, it's sort of setting the ground for a visual language um, that would then, um, I suppose, uh, contribute to um, the role, thinking about the role of cinema in, in educational research and how it provides us with new and um, diverse pictures that might encourage us to see education differently. Um, in order to do that, um, or, or rather what I find of interest in cinema a lot of the time, is that it provides us with representations of the basic building blocks from which um, we form our earliest understandings of education. That is, it reminds us of what teachers look like and how people first encounter them, um, of what a school is or is not. Um, and how children actually behave rather than how they do or should behave in theory. Um, but that, of course, depends on, on the film. A film like Samira McMalbuff's Blackboards, for example, um, achieves this quite effectively by representing phenomena um, such as teachers, um, but in an environment that is completely alien to us, i.e. they are itinerant teachers with blackboards on their backs, not people who sit and await students in a classroom. To think about the role of the teacher in this way as someone who has to beg others almost um, to buy their custom uh, so that they can teach them basic literacy and numer numeracy um, offers a different perspective on who the teacher is or could be. So we have to begin with basic phenomena, phenomena things that um, Wittgenstein describes as anything that can be observed. So again, the emphasis on the visual and um, not things that are invisible, um, out of sight. Um, from there, the phenomena and the relations between them come to form our conceptual um, understanding. We talk, we utter words and only later get a picture of their life and once these things become pictures um, they are closely connected to our conceptual understanding, concepts being the expression of our interest. So rather than being abstract things that our reason is um, grasping to try and understand, as in Kant, um, a concept uh, 
is something that exists in our language, in, in the ways that we talk about it and, and what we um, express of ourselves and of the world in, in talking about it. So films are very good at providing representation of educational phenomena for everyone to see at the same time, but they also just express or direct an interest in seeing relations between those phenomena and seeing them in new lights. In so doing, I think um, in presenting us with new pictures of um, education, film has the capacity to um, cultivate um, an aesthetic sensibility for what education might look like under different um, and varying circumstances. Accepting the possibilities contained within our counters with phenomena requires the development of a particular sensibility by which we come to appreciate different pictures of things rather than striving for the complete picture and also being able to judge or compare pic certain pictures with one another. The development of such sensibility is often better cultivated by the arts than it is within scholarship, whether in philosophy, education or film, because they permit us to rethink the world through what Robert Sinnebrink calls aesthetic disclosure, making them forms of thinking that use different means than philosophy in order to think, create and communicate experience. I think again we can get distracted by the question of whether film is or does philosophy um, when in, in fact it may be just more helpful to look at what films are saying and doing in their own right. Okay, need to wrap up soon. Um, but just to say uh, further, um, in sort of defense of, of film as um, educational research method or leading from film in educational research, the importance of it uh, lies in it being a motion picture. Um, film can be seen as framing or dramatizing educational phenomena as meaningful in motion, which shows all of the ways in which um, phenomena such as uh, teachers, schools, children, etc. They encounter each other for the first time, the sorts of roles and relations they have um, with one another, all of those in motion such that we are able to register equally with the subjects involved what they come to mean at that time. Motion is a reminder that our concepts do not conform to fixity, but I think um, also really important compared to um, art forms like theatre or um, the novel, one of the great advantages that film has is that it's able to register on the faces of individuals exactly how um, things are being received, how encounters with phenomena impact upon them. Um, and I think this is shown very nicely um, in Samira McMahon Buff's film The Apple, where two girls um, are documented going out into the world for the first time after 11 years of captivity. And of course, the educational narrative or the interest in education on the part of the director there is kind of made clear about uh, through the questions being asked um, of whether they would have benefited from a formal education but also the comparison of the girls um, with other girls of their own age wearing school uniforms in comparison to, to their um, uh, uh, normal clothes. Um, those sorts of um, charting um, the, the, these encounters can make film um, can reveal to us once again the sorts of early encounters we all have um, with these phenomena and how they shape our understanding of education. Um, I should say that obviously, you know, that doesn't mean um, that uh, the sorts of education that they might receive is necessarily um, better or worse, or that I can have a full understanding um, of that. But there are enough 
um, things going on within the film um, to suggest um, a directorial interest in what a formal education would mean for these girls because they have been deprived of it. So finally, um, I mean, the sorts of films that I've kind of discounted um, as being either about education or taking an interest in it or being educationally interesting are films like Harry Potter, because I've discussed how Ron and Harry um, aren't really very convincing 11 year olds if looked at more closely in terms of their behaviour. Um, equally, uh, with Dead Poet Society, what we're presented with is a teacher who doesn't do an awful lot to change attitudes um, uh, towards teaching other than affirm the fact that um, he's the sort of teacher that the sort of teacher that a lot of people might want to have. Um, so I'm more interested in those those sort of films that um, maybe uh, invite us to see the concept differently. And finally, a film like Clueless, a, a wonderful film maybe, but not one um, that has much interest in education at all. Um, uh, it's much more to do with relationships. So the sorts of films that do feature more strongly in, in the book are ones like Jean Vigo's Zero for Conduct, in which the spirit of youth is seen as um, the direct challenge to educational authority and the source for educational change. Um, or one like um, Ryan Fleck's Half Nelson, where the teacher is deliberately portrayed as someone who fails rather than succeeds um, uh, as an inspirational teacher in the way that um, Robin Williams does. Or um, Jeff Oppenahi's The Mirror, uh, which frames the film um, by starting with a shot of, of a school and, and a girl who has left, been left outside the school because her mother hasn't come to pick her up, then follows the girl um, uh, and uh, as she tries to get home until the point that she gets on a bus and turns to the camera and decides that she's not going to make the film anymore. The, the film then becomes educationally interesting, I think, because um, it reminds us of a child's agency in a way that um, perhaps a lot of um, theorizing around childhood um, f either forgets or cannot um, represent in quite as startling a fashion. So um, I've gone over just slightly, apologies for that, but um, my concluding thoughts then really, uh, are really that um, uh, this kind of approach is maybe just one that asks for more pictures of, of education, that, that we diversify the sorts of things, uh, the sources and resources um, for thinking about education as a concept. Um, and uh, and particularly in terms of the visual, such that we can develop an appreciation for what education looks like in different contexts and different situations. By extension, this hopefully affords an appreciation for um, uh, contexts in which good practice might well be supported by particular pictures, even if that same picture does not satisfy other conditions. But a conceptual investigation into education on this view seeks not the El Dorado of education's being, um, either what it is um, uh, ontologically or theoretically, um, but a sensibility for its meaningfulness um, in any given context, a sense for what it does or could look like. Um, I think. That's it. Apologies for going over.
Um, hello, I'm not going to put my microphone, uh, my video off if that's okay. It's a bit untidy in here. Um, wait till I find my question because I can't remember what it is. Um, oh yes, when you said about don't think but look, that sort of assumes that looking doesn't have any relation to thinking. And so if we're only looking, how can that help us to apprehend something? Because we'd need to think about what we were looking at. Sorry. Um, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, so the way that I understand the don't think but look um, point is that uh, it's sort of what I was saying about the, the kind of primacy of a film. Um, or in, in some ways of the visual in general, um, look first, um, because I think, you know, thinking can't help but follow from that. So um, uh, I'm not sure, although I, I don't want to sort of second guess um, Wittgenstein in this, but I don't think that anything is being said here about um, not thinking at all, because we can't help but think. Rather, he's sort of saying, look at the world um, as uh, as it is either before your eyes or, or in our language um, and see whether things are actually the way that um, they are then conceived of uh, in, uh, in a lot of um, philosophy and theory. Um, so when you say uh, the danger is that looking is only a shallow flirtatious gaze on an object which has no meaning, um, I think in lots of ways what he is asking us to do is kind of flip um, the Cartesian sort of a gaze, um, whereby you're not sort of trying to look inwards and establish what it is that you know, um, first of all, particularly about yourself, um, but from there you can then go and make, um, deduce things about the world. Rather, um, that uh, attention or focus on the world should inform um, our understanding um, of things that we then come to conceptualise. So what he really should have said was, look, then think, rather <laughs> than don't think but look. Well, um, yes, possibly. I think that, um, yeah, uh, there is, um, there is a, a sort of moment in, in the philosophical investigations where he almost kind of takes uh, Descartes implicitly to task because he talks about how um, we have no reason to think that other people might be automata or, or robots essentially um, and this refers to kind of Descartes' um, uh, famous um, the, the moment in uh, in the meditations where he's sort of at his window looking down at people passing um, below and, and thinking oh well all of these people in their hats and capes um, they, they could all be automata um, and uh, you know, the don't think but look injunction is one that sort of says, well, actually, you know, if you if you look at people, um, you have no reason to think that they aren't human beings. Um, and, and the way that they behave gives you every reason to believe that they are. Um, so to introduce that kind of false doubt, it comes from a process of thought that isn't borne out by the way that we actually relate to people. Okay. Uh, indeed, it does. Um, uh, I was wondering, like, without preceding concepts, without preceding notions, how do we know what to look at? The world is quite big. So if we just look, uh, there's everything and nothing. And it's usually concepts theories, you might say, uh, that lead us to look into a specific place. Without concepts, without theories, I think you wouldn't even be able to decide that's an educational movie or that is education in a movie, because it would just be everything. So I can't really see this flipping happening. Uh, all I'm at the moment able to see is 
pretending we don't have those concepts and then we pretend we can learn something new by looking into the world or looking in this movie. Of course, there, there will be something new, but this new will just extend something that we already know. Otherwise, we wouldn't really know what to look at. Um, I, uh, well, I wonder whether the, the use of, of concept is, is quite um, the same in, uh, in, in what I've been talking about and, and what you're suggesting, because uh, you seem to be aligning concepts and theories with each other, um, whereas I sort of argued that perhaps um, they are somewhat opposed, which is to say that um, the, the Wittgensteinian understanding of a concept is that it is the expression of our interest in something. Um, so that whenever I'm talking of education, um, implied in that is my own interest in it. Um, so that I think is true then also of, um, can be as true of a film director as it is of um, a, a philosopher of education, say, um, that you, uh, you can take as the expression of your interest um, a concept like um, education. Uh, what it's not sort of suggesting is that um, a concept is in any sense um, something to be grasped by reason, rather it is just something that exists within our language. And so what I've tried to describe is how, you know, what are those moments when I first come to understand the concept of, of education? And they will come about through various encounters. Um, they could be um, school assemblies, uh, meals with your parents, parent-teacher meetings, whatever it is, where, um, you know, people use expressions like you must make the most of your education. Um, and only then do you begin to understand that expressions like that bind together um, aspects of schooling, um, success, uh, aspiration, um, mobility and uh, and that sort of thing um but that those are not independent of of the uses that they have in uh usages of the, that they have in people's um language and expression um so our concepts um therefore and and they are diverse um allow us uh, to see it in, in, in many different ways through those, those initial encounters, rather than it being something that um, uh, is reducible entirely to, uh, to a single explanation um, or, or theory. Uh, in terms of what to focus on, I think, um, well, maybe that relates to Claire's question slightly, I'm not sure. Um, perhaps. Uh, that will probably take too long. <laughs> I'll leave it to that. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you very much, Alexis, for your presentation. Um, I have to say that I think maybe it's the first chapter where you really discuss these issues in detail and you give an excellent explanation of Wittgenstein. So, Thank you for that. Um, that's just a little promo for people to actually read the book. <laughs> um, so it, it, my question is related to Carstens because I'm wondering what is it in any particular film that we can pick out and say, all right, that's education or that embodies or exemplifies education in some way. And I suppose I've been thinking about this more in terms of philosophy in my own writing. So what makes a film philosophical? And at what point could we say that it is or that film itself philosophizes? And so how do we almost decipher that in any particular film? Because you've got those films which are almost obvious and outrightly 
education and about education like your history boys, dead poet society, etc. So we've got those which are set in schools and or they're about schooling or university life. But then obviously the kinds of films you're looking at, the education in one sense could be seen as more implicit. So I'm just wondering if the aesthetic sensitivity you were talking about in terms of what we could learn from film, whether you almost have to have a certain level of sensitivity when you watch the film in the first place, if that makes mm. sense. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry, yeah. that was maybe a bit rambling. <laughs> no, thank you. And um, so, I um, th this comes back in, in some ways to, to the kind of pointing exercise um, thing because, um, you know, Wittgenstein describes how we come into language through uh, what he calls ostensive definition a lot of the time, which is you point at a dog uh, and that's how you know that that's a dog. And once you sort of pointed at enough dogs, um, uh, it becomes possible to recognize that thing each time you see it. Um, and uh, you soon learn that sort of pointing at a hyena or a wolf is not the same thing as pointing at a, a dog and how to differentiate these things. Um, but also um, why a wild dog, for instance, might have that, that name as well. So um, uh, it, it, I think that process of kind of ostensive definition happens both in um, sort of um, uh, the visual um, and, and then I was sort of, when I, when I first thought about um, this book, I was sort of like, well, how can we say anything about um, uh, what is educational about film if, um, if you have to know what education is, surely, um, or should be, in order to sort of say what is educational about film. Um, and then to sort of think, well, well, what is education such that I can see it happening in relation to film or on film? Um, and so I suppose it's led me back to what might be considered quite a kind of conservative um, uh, relation to, to these things um, for, for those that are looking for more radical um, rethinkings of education. But what I've suggested is actually the way that um, we come to see education differently is not by looking or trying to think about how it's educational, um, by looking at what it shows us of education. And that means looking at the phenomena we most mm -hmm. closely associate with the concept, i.e. teachers, schools, children, um, classrooms, uh, universities, um, all of these kinds of things. And yes, that might be quite, um, quite a kind of conservative approach in some ways, but that is, I think, true to how most people first encounter an appreciation of the concept such that it can be transformed in their understanding in later life. You have to have some grasp of its relationship to those phenomena in order for it to change or be transformed into different things. So what I've suggested is, yes, like I'm, I'm interested in those films that do represent explicitly mm. phenomena most commonly associated with education, but do so in ways that don't only reaffirm things that we think we already know about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, hold on a second to find it in the chat again. My apologies. Um, oh yeah, so we must use the imagination to see images and see things. And the imagination that we have sometimes called combinatorial, so it takes concepts that we already have and sort of mixes them all up to make something else. And um, if that's the case, then something can't come from nothing because we have these deep representations or concepts already in our 
our mind when we're looking at the image object, including film. So surely we must start with concept and then when we look at the images it can change but it doesn't make a new one, it doesn't make something completely new. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, in some ways I sort of think um, a lot of the time our use of the word education does not require um, a, a deep representation, as you say, of, of it. Um, uh, sort of um, describe uh, the, um, I don't know, the, the experience of trying to, to, to shop uh, for groceries during lockdown uh, to, to return home and sort of say, well, that was an education doesn't require a deep concept on, on behalf of either the speaker or the other person um, to know what is being said there. Um, and uh, in some ways, the kind of, um, kind of things that I'm suggesting in relation to, um, to film are that uh, the most that it can really do is to remind us um, that actually um, education um, often features um, in our kind of vocabulary and, and grammar in, in ways that are not nearly as elaborate um, as we often intellectualize them or theorize them as. Um, but that is not to say um, that, it, that they are no um, more, no less helpful in getting us to um, see them differently. So to be alert to the possibility that they could be seen differently. Um, I'm not, yeah, so in some ways a deep representation might be um, closer to, to a kind of a, a picture and a picture possibly that, that is inclined to, to hold us captive rather than one that is simply um, uh, available for comparison with other pictures. Is, is that not the problem though with concepts, that we hold them quite deeply, they're not usually, they are changeable, but we kind of hold them there and we can't really escape them. I also, just one other thing, what you said about like going shopping in lockdown, we might say that was an education, is that not just a language issue that we use education too much in like different ways? Well, um, in some ways, yeah, it is, but actually uh, what I want to suggest is, um, uh, rather than trying to police the language so much to sort of say, well, that's, it's inappropriate to use education in that context, in, in some ways I think um, it's, um, there is value to diversifying or, or celebrating the many usages that we do have, whilst also recognising that there are ways or times in which certain usages um, possibly um, aren't either applicable or, or appropriate. Um, and a lot of those do have to do, I think, possibly with the conflation of experience and, and education. Um, maybe to say, well, that was an experience rather than that was an education is one of those instances, except that I think that what is, someone is saying when they use the expression, that was an education, is that they actually want to give a more specific form or shape um, to the experience that they had, which would then be described as education rather than um, a simple kind of um, a, a moment in a sort of Bergsonian flow of time. Okay, thank you. If I can, I just want to uh, follow on from, I think, well, I think it follows on from Nicola's point, which I, I guess is I spent this morning uh, on a Zoom call with a, a group of SLT from a series of primary schools. Um, I don't think that we could have coped that meeting without a much closer uh, reading of education than would be allowable. Now, so I'm quite happy that in, in everyday conversation we use the word in all kinds of ways. But it seems to me that it, when we're talking about a, a particular education institution, like a school, um, that actually we need a much more well-defined, it might be broad and it may be 
uh, possible that we can, and part of the project I'm working on is rethinking what the school might provide uh, curricular wise uh, going forward. But, uh, so we are thinking about innovation, but nevertheless, it has to be a much more precise uh, conception of education in order to get the conversation of the ground and because of the context in which they're working. It's a professional use of the term. So I guess I'm, part of what I'm suggesting is, is it possible that in, in everyday conversation we use education very broadly, but in the professional world of being educators, that we need a much more precise uh, uh, definition and concept in order to take both the conversation and the practice forward in meaningful ways? Yeah, and um, I, I, I do think that that is um, probably the case. I think I, I was sort of saying that at the end, that something of this sensibility that I was trying to describe sort of um, is about knowing which picture is most appropriate almost in relation to the situation that, that you are looking at and how that picture might be able to inform um, the sorts of practices that you are conducting. But actually, um, and maybe I haven't put this very well, but what I, I have sort of been trying to describe is the ways in which ordinary um, expressions might hold our stronger conceptions to account and actually show them um, sometimes be expressions in which we allow education to mean something not always kind of utopian, this sort of horizon to which everyone might want to um, uh, aspire, uh, but sometimes it's just something that we are indifferent towards, something um, we feel neutrally towards, or something that sometimes in some people's language um, uh, is very kind of pejorative, and the fact that we can accept um, someone sort of saying we don't need no education, we don't need no thought control, for instance, um, that that is not saying we don't need and fostering, nurturing, cultivating process, as Dewey describes it. It's saying we don't want indoctrination for our children. And so to have those things hold each other to account, I think, um, uh, allows for a greater appreciation for the range um, of a, a sort of spectrum um, that we can entertain in relation to it. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, coming towards the end of our time, uh, uh, oh, uh, if I take Andrew and then Elizabeth's question, because Andrew's got a hand up. So I'll take that as a, um, I don't know whether it's on this point, um, but uh, Andrew. Hello, can you hear me okay? Hello, Alexis. Yes. Hi. Hello, thank you for your talk and hello to everyone. Um, uh, I had a, a, a quick point and then a, a question on film. Um, the, the, the first point was about um, the elasticity of the concept of education. Um, I was going to say that a useful, um, it's not gainsaying what you've said, it's sort of an addition or another point. I mean, one of the things that comes from elasticity is that contests, uh, that, that, that concepts become contested as well. Gali talked about essentially contested concepts and there's a lot of good work in political science about this, a sort of ordinary language approach to political science. And I, I was going to suggest that, that, that it's not necessarily use the example of abstractly discussing time vis-a-vis -vis time as we ordinarily would use it in a practical everyday sense and we get confused once we're asked abstractly but it could also be that the difficulty with education is that it's contested that people are tussling over the meanings of it as well and wanting education to be what i think or what you think and so on um, not necessarily that it's confusing because we start looking at it abstractly necessarily um, so that was one point that arises from elasticity um, but my, my main my main one was about a film question really connected to film which i, I think you'd like me to do <laughs> so you, in your penultimate slide um uh, I suppose I want to press you on the link with film specifically um, because you mentioned motion um, uh, in relation to film, but I wasn't exactly clear why that was being uh, sort of valorized by or preferred as an idea. Um, so I'll just give an example. I mean, theatre has motion as well. Um, dramatically, characters move. You could have a picture of education in a play 
I mean, I'm not an expert on pictures of education and plays. Let's say the history boys. I'm not saying that because I think it's good in any way. I'm just, just using it as an example. Um, uh, but I, I'm not quite saying, with the exception of the fact that theatre can't do close-up, but on this thing about motion and being presented, what is it as such about film that you're interested in the sort of pictures film seems to present as distinct, say, from a media like theatre? Um, yes, okay, so, um, uh, I think the interesting thing about films, um, and I forget where this comes from because it's not, it's not my point, um, one of the interesting things about it, uh, a number of things that are interesting about the film, um, particularly as I, as I come to appreciate as a kind of um, resource for, for research um, in this this kind of area is that um, a, a film is available to all of the same people to watch and to repeat watch um, uh, whereas um, for instance a, a theatre performance can never be repeated a, a film will always be the same when it's replayed um, even though you might see it differently each time. So that is one thing. Um, the other thing about motion, I suppose, um, and uh, I, um, I, I've sort of talked about this, yeah, it, it, in, in the book, but I, I don't know whether it quite answers your question about the, the sort of the medium itself. Um, but it's able to retrieve and revisit meaningful moments of the human experience in motion, allowing it to frame objects and human encounters with them in ways that are unique to the medium in registering the effect of those encounters. Um, and I, uh, so the, the framing aspect is very interesting to me over theatre because of course everything is, is within the frame at any one time in theatre. Um, Whereas in film, your attention is directed and therefore you are conscious of someone expressing um, uh, their interest through that direction um, a lot more. Um, which feels, has the feel, to, me, to my mind at least, of, of a much more kind of conversational engagement on the subject of, of any concept, if done in particular ways. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I haven't written a lot more about the kind of the motion aspect to it, but um, uh, I, I'll have to think of it, think on it a bit more. Okay, thanks. I suspect motion is not where it lies, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave, yeah, I'll leave okay. you that singling out. But, um, but, but thank you, thank you for your answer, and sorry I jumped the gun, Elizabeth, on you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi, Alexis. Um, thanks very much. That was brilliant. Um, and I just had one kind of thought. You were talking, uh, you mentioned there briefly about what film can do. And I've been thinking a lot myself recently about the usefulness of being confused and looking for collaboration uh, in and through and out of that confusion and actually you just alluded to one of the things that I thought might be important about film in that you can replay it and you can you can bring it back to a group and you can it, that in that sort of sense of dwelling on something and maybe it alludes back to what Claire was talking about about what makes a film philosophical and then maybe when is a film philosophical in in, in your thinking about it and where you're using it rather than the philosophy being in the film, but the philosophy being in the watching of the film, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, and I was just wondering about that idea of opening people up to the possibility of being sensitive rather than having needing to be sensitive in advance or needing to be aware of things in, in advance, but rather that what film has, has that potential to to say, no, you don't need to be anything in advance or understand anything in, in advance. Instead, be open to being surprised, be open mm. to being confused, be open to these phenomena, especially when you are one of the phenomena. So, for example, if you are a teacher. Oh, yeah, I think um, there would be something quite um, 
quite wrong. I'm sorry if I um, said it in this way, but if I was suggesting that there needs to be some kind of preparedness involved in, in what I was calling an aesthetic sensibility, that rather it's definitely something that is only formed through exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and that, of course, is, I suppose, one of the risks of these things. Um, uh, that's, um, yeah, people have to be surprised without having been um, uh, either trained in, in what to see or how to be surprised um, beforehand. Um, and, uh, but then, of course, you don't know what it is exactly that's ever going to surprise anyone, uh, and that could be part of the risk. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the other thing is, and this refers back to what Claire was saying, I think th this is part of a process, right, and it where, is where I think teachers are important, because um, the sorts of things that might surprise people, um, uh, students, um, children, whatever it is, uh, sometimes their attention has to be drawn to those things in order to be surprised. But once it is, they find that interesting and then they're able to find um, similar things um, it, elsewhere. Now that could be seen as a mode of kind of guiding people's um, aesthetic sensibility, um, but it's only in the sense that, uh, you know, um, we do have all sorts of things pointed out to us um, at all sorts of different times and then we are able to apply um, that kind of uh, thing elsewhere and see see whether it sort of sticks, has validity, or can be transformed into something else. Um, so there are creative capacities that go along with that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>